AFIO Now is presented by Northwest Financial Advisors, where our world revolves around you. Hello, everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with former U.S. intelligence officers and those who write about them. Today, I have a very interesting guest with a fascinating book. His name is Matthew Black. He is a crime and labor historian and journalist. He's published, and he has a brand new book out this last September. It's called Operation Underworld. Matthew, welcome to AFIO Now. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you for having me. Matthew, what's this book about? Um. Yeah, so it's, it's called Operation Underworld, uh, how the mafia and U.S. government teamed up to win World War II. Um, and at a high-level view, it's the story of how the Navy defended the Port of New York during World War II. Now, the story starts out uh, with the threat emerging. There's a, a, quite a, a catastrophic event where the ship um, that's being refitted in uh, the Upper West Side um, in New York Harbor uh, called the Normandy. It's the second largest ship in the world. It was a, a luxury French cruise liner. It was taken over by the U.S. when they fell to the Germans, and it was being refitted into a troop transport ship. Uh, it was one of the most important ships uh, in the Atlantic because it was going to be able to ferry 15,000 troops across the Atlantic, uh, and it could outrun any U-boat that chased it. Um, and unfortunately, on the morning of February 9th, 1942, uh, just two months into uh, the U.S. involvement in World War II, uh, the Normandy went up in flames. Uh, the entire top deck was consumed by fire. Um, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers uh, saw the whole incident. Uh, you know, the, uh, the fire department, despite its best efforts, you know, were able to extinguish the blaze. Um, but they hurled so much water on board that the ship actually ended up capsizing uh, and the ship was lost. Um, and in such a public fashion, people would be very, very scared. The public was scared. The Navy was concerned that there may be spies and saboteurs who have infiltrated the harbor, you know, the, the port of New York. Um, and so it became a mission of can we make sure that, A, this doesn't happen again, um, and B, can we get our men in place, you know, to do so? The Navy had basically zero luck in getting any men on the ground. Uh, uh, on the piers. Um, and the reason for that is because the unions that, you know, the laborers that worked there were part of unions that were very much not friendly to any authority figure. Uh, and the reason for that is that they were mostly immigrants who have come from the old world, who respected the Padron system, which was something that the mafia used themselves. And they would play, the laborers would play d d or deaf and dumb when anybody came around asking questions. So the Navy had zero success in infiltrating those areas and the ports, which are, you know, extremely vital to the functions of war and sending supplies over to England, who was hanging by a thread uh, and mainly uh, hanging on because of the supplies uh, that the U.S. was able to get to them. And so the Navy did a, a, um, a very uh, unique thing. They needed someone to, and this is a quote from the book, snap the whip on the entire underworld. And so what they did was they found out that the mafia were were the ones who were running the unions and basically running the ports down there. And so they recruited some high-level mafia uh, individuals um, to help them defend the port of New York. And then, um, uh, of course, through this partnership, they go through many events, many efforts to protect uh, the homeland. And this intelligence network that's established is also uh, crucial uh, in America's first uh, uh, attempts to take the fight to the enemy um, over in Europe. So that's kind of the synopsis of of the book. (laughs) How did you come across the idea and what kind of uh, resource material did you find? Yeah, yeah, kind of an interesting story. I I was I was back in 2018. I was working at a digital history magazine uh, called History 101, and uh, I was tasked with writing some of the, the greatest history stories known to the country mainly, uh, and some, some world history as well. So I wrote a story on uh, Operation Underworld um, back then, 
2018, and then it did okay. It, 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 so, some people read it. So I don't think people really knew the story. And then I, I lost my job during the pandemic. The company went under, and I was, you know, one of these people. What am I going to do, you know, during the pandemic? But I was getting government assistance. It was okay, but it was really starting to get worrisome. Like, oh my gosh, am I going to be able to continue this this writing thing? And then I got contacted out of the blue by a New York Times bestselling author named Julie Checkaway, uh, who wrote uh, The Three-Year Swim Club. And she had come across my story on a, on a Twitter feed. Somebody had just posted it uh, there. And, you know, like a lot of people during the pandemic, she had the time to go ahead and click these links and, and read the story. And she absolutely fell in love with it. You know, being that she's partnered, uh, you know, with an agent, um, you know, they reached out to me and I was, you know, I told them, I'm like, it's not a very well-known story. I, I think it's already been told. And they assured me that there's a huge, you know, audience, military, mafia, historians uh, who would love this. So uh, for me, I, I've always loved, um, I guess my love for the mafia comes out of movies, you know, <laughs> mainly. But uh, of course, that doesn't stop me from learning their history. And um, I've always loved military history, crime history, labor history. I wrote a book previously um, about a... Um, a labor boss. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why they wanted me as well for that connection to the story. Also, because I already knew where to find the main resources for the story. Uh, much, much of it is derived from an investigation that took place um, uh, in the 1950s um, called the Herlin's investigation. And so that yielded about 3000 pages of um, testimony and about a hundred page report that investigation was classified uh, for decades uh, thereafter. And then um, when it finally did become declassified, uh, there was a book written about it that was very awful. <laughs> That's why you probably haven't, uh, most people haven't heard of the story prior to. That's where I got the material. But it's interesting because during this time, during the time of the pandemic, uh, as maybe some of you know, you know, libraries and archives were were shut down. And it was it, well, it was impossible to, to get an appointment, you know, to go in and review materials. So I give a big shout out to the University of Rochester because they were taking requests from folks to digitize material in their archives. So over the course of about a year and a half, I had these thousands of pages uploaded and sent to me. Yeah, that's that's how I uh, conducted the bulk of the research. There were, of course, a few Freedom of Information Act requests and stuff, but that was the bulk of it right there. Matthew, who was Lieutenant Commander Haffenden, and what was his role? So Commander Haffenden is uh, the other main character in this book. Um, the other the other main character would be uh, uh, Lucky Luciano. I know, I know, we'll get to him. Uh, I'm sure shortly, but um, you know, uh, so I have a, a picture of Commander Haffenden here, and you know, this is him as a as a young man. Um, but, uh, the time of operation underworld, um, you know, he, he was more middle-aged, um, hairline receding, uh, uh, wasn't very healthy. Um, his waistline was expanding. Um, and, and I think it's funny that, you know, maybe a lot of people would do this, but this is the picture that was in his office right there. Young man, cunning eyes, <laughs> you know, uh, looking sharp, but, um, you know, he was a Naval intelligence officer who led. Operation Underworld. Um, you know, he was a he was a family man. He was very intelligent and um, very much a free thinker. Um, he was very. He was also very confident in his abilities and his judgment, and uh, the latter of which would constantly come into question. Um, when the book starts, uh, he's a bit of a dreamer who never really made it in the corporate world. Um, you know, and he's kind of approaching an age where he, he's running out of time to define his legacy. And so the way he saw it, World War II and Operation Underworld were his chance to define that legacy. And he went to extraordinary lengths to make sure that he was defined as a hero uh, by the end of the war. Um, and, uh, you know, if you read this book, um, I'm sure that you will probably question that notion, however. <laughs> Matthew, who were agents X, Y, and George? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was um, able to obtain uh, their photos, um, and uh, these individuals have not been known um, uh, pretty much ever. The book Operation Underworld is the first uh, linking of Agent X and Agent Y to their actual names, and then I'll get to Agent George in a second. But um, So Agent X uh, was a civilian named Dominic Seiko. 
Uh, and he ran a private investigative practice uh, for decades in New York. Um, and he was also Commander Happenden's very best friend uh, and most trusted advisor. Um, during his participation in Operation Underworld, he conducted several top secret missions, um, all while assuming various false identities uh, at war production plants, waterfront operations, uh, and buildings in downtown Manhattan. Um, and then Agent Y uh, was another civilian named Felix Seiko, uh, and he was Dominic Seiko's younger brother. Um, and he was also a good friend of Commander Haffenden. Um, and that's why he was, you know, why they were brought into Operation Underworld. Um, and Felix Seiko was also, he, he was also a private investigator like his brother. Um, and he also had a very important special set of skills uh, that made him invaluable to missions in, that they conducted in downtown Manhattan. Uh, and that is that he had taught himself the art of lock picking. Uh, you know, and when they were spying on, um, uh, you know, individuals, uh, they made missions um, into foreign consulates. Uh, his ability to open, you know, uh, file cabinets, um, uh, safes uh, were invaluable. And uh, this is the first time this book uh, uh, reveals their their photos, their identities. Uh, we've known some things about Agent X and Y, but we haven't known their names before. Um, and then Agent George had been previously identified, um, uh, and he was on the team because he was a safe cracker, uh, and he <laughs> he's also a self admitted professional burglar, uh, you know, formerly, um, you know, long before Operation Underworld, um, he began to use his skills for the side of good. So he had already turned um, uh, prior to this. And, um, you know, being on the side of good, um, he was he was also invaluable in these missions that took place in downtown Manhattan. And of course, cracking safes, you know, in order to, you know, see the contents in there, secret communications and such like that. Um, and he wrote a book, about uh, his missions in downtown New York during World War II. Uh, and the title of it is a law enforcement term called surreptitious entry, uh, which is, you know, basically means burglary. But, you know, when it's law enforcement doing it, it's legal. <laughs> they call it a surreptitious entry. Who were some of the major um, mafioso involved and what were their roles? Yeah. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, Lucky Luciano is one of the main characters in the book, um, and you know he's a uh, he's a calculating mafia leader who basically tried to run Cosa Nostra like a corporation, like a Fortune 500 company, even though that wasn't around back then. But he effectively organized crime in the United States um, entirely, and uh, his ambitions were thwarted um, in uh, 1936 when he received a 30 to 50 year prison sentence. Um, and the, uh, uh, the charges were for, um, uh, pandering. Basically he was running a prostitution ring, which, which was a huge embarrassment for him, but no less true. Uh, while in prison though, um, he was waiting for an opportunity to get back to the top of the underworld. So when we, when he's introduced in operation underworld, he's been in prison for six years. His last appeal, um, has been rejected and he's looking at a very long, prison sentence. So, but the other, other individuals in his inner circle, you know, certainly schemed to help him out. And, um, Operation Underworld was kind of their, their intermediary, their means to do it. So, um, another big mafioso character is, is Meyer Lansky. Um, uh, and then, uh, a, a lower level one named Sox Lanza. And they were responsible for bringing this opportunity of Operation Underworld to Luciano. Meyer Lansky was, you know, Luciano's longtime friend and advisor. They had been friends since they were kids um, and they had been committing crimes and running in gangs ever since then. Lansky was a genius, a mathematical genius, and he was known as the accountant of the mob. He also visited Luciano in prison during Operation Underworld more than any other individual. So a very important character in the story. And then while Luciano and Lansky and also Frank Costello, who uh, many of you may have heard of, are, are the big names uh, in the story. There's also a mid-ranking soldier who I just mentioned named Joseph Sox Lanza. Um, and he was a notorious murderer and criminal, um, but he also was the key to enabling Haffenden's men to infiltrate areas around the waterfront uh, in New York City proper. He was known as the czar of the Fulton Fish Market. Fulton Fish Market was the biggest fish market in the world. 25% of America's seafood ran through there. It was at the southern tip of Manhattan, a very strategically important place. 
and his nickname Socks was given to him because he would sock people with his fist, brass knuckles, or a giant fish, you know, whatever was closest, uh, whatever you could brandish. So, <laughs> Matthew, do we have any insight into the kinds of intelligence that Huffington's teams were able to uh, acquire during these surreptitious entry operations? Yeah, gosh, I mean, talk about a book within a book. Yeah, I mean, you know, there there are some limitations on my conclusions, and I'll go through this in my end notes. But um, you know, this this team of you know Agent X, Agent Y, Agent George, uh, and then several naval officers to go along with it, um, other civilian agents that had various skills, you know, were teamed up to break into foreign consulates in downtown Manhattan. Um, now it wasn't like they were breaking into anyone and just, you know, uh, making sure things were good. There was intelligence, you know, that was being gathered that one consulate in particular may have, may have had something fishy going on. So the consulate in question had an, uh, a branch in Washington, DC and intelligence uh, officers were noticed that they had burned a bunch of material, a bunch of papers. Okay. Now, they don't know what was burning, but obviously, if you're a, a foreign consulate, a diplomat, you know, an ambassador at an embassy, and you're burning papers, you're trying to hide something. Um, so the task commander happened in with taking a look at this foreign consulate uh, in New York City. Um, so that's where these surreptitious entries um, come into play. So we know we know that the consulate in question was a Spanish-speaking nation. Um, I, you know, I had uh, every foreign consulate that was open in New York City in 1942, 1943, but it was difficult to link it, link their surreptitious entries. And we know these happened. There were 50 of these such missions because we have the testimony of naval officers. They didn't speak of the details, uh, but they did acknowledge that these missions happened. Agent George gave us a little more detail um, into what happened, but he didn't actually link it to a, to a spy ring. Um, and so I, I made notes about this in my end notes and uh, I came about 90% to my conclusion, but I just, I, you know, I couldn't link it. So I didn't, didn't put it in there, but here's, here's what it is. You know, there was a, a spy ring that was uncovered or excuse me, it was uncovered in World War II, but it wasn't deep the report about them didn't get declassified until the 1970s. And I'm not going to tell you the name of the spy ring because I'm probably going to write a book about it someday. But um, there are 30,000 pages that uh, of testimony, uh, documents, material pertaining to this particular spy ring. And from what I did find out about them, that there was a network in various port cities in the U.S. and they were supplying information to the Germans about U.S. shipping. And, you know, of course, in the context of the Battle of the Atlantic and World War II, you know, uh, uh, folks know that in the early years of the war, the U.S. and uh, Allied shipping was getting decimated by German U-boats. Um, now, there are reasons for that. Um, you know, we didn't effectively employ the convoy system early enough. Uh, a big reason for that was because we simply didn't have enough warships uh, to do so. Um, but um, a another reason for their success was that there is some evidence that various individuals in port cities were able to get information about Allied shipping out to German U-boat commanders uh, through various intermediaries. Uh, and in this case, this spy network uh, operated in various port cities in the U.S. Um, and they were, through this consulate in New York City, um, were able to supply information to those U-boats. Now, the twist of it is... Um, and I found this amazing is that the spy ring was actually run by the Japanese, not the Germans. Um, and then they used um, the consulate of a neutral nation who was sympathetic to the German cause uh, in order to forward that information onto the Germans. So there's still some links to be made in course the, you know, in the story, but um, that's, that's basically what they were looking for. Fascinating. I understand there's an interesting story about someone who provided support to the uh, surreptitious uh, entry operations. Oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I actually have this page marked in my book. Um, it won't be long, <laughs> but I'm actually going to just go ahead and read this part because uh, it's kind of fun. Uh, so this is while they're conducting a, a surreptitious entry. Um, they have opened a safe and found uh, a letter that says um, secret only to be opened in the case of war. 
Um, now they want to read what's inside this letter. They want to know the contents, but um, that's a bit difficult. If you open it, uh, somebody's going to know that you opened it. Um, so they needed a method to open the letter, read its contents, and make sure that nobody knew that they did it. So, despite all the law enforcement agencies and intelligence outfits in the United States, it turned out to be MI6, British intelligence, who were going to fly in a specialist to help. When it was mission time again, the specialists from MI6 joined squad number three. The men were surprised to learn that only was this British, this, excuse me, not only was this agent British, but she was also a woman. She was in her mid fifties with an athletic build and she was not one for conversation. Agent George wasn't impressed with her personality, but her gear certainly made an impression on him as it took two sailors to carry her incredible assortment of electric burners, pots, pans, and tea kettles. The men, the men wondered what the hell this equipment was for. After the team had entered the consulate's office a third time, the specialists from MI6 waited patiently until Agent George had opened the safe once again. The agent from MI6 heated up water in one of her electric tea kettles, which had a long, thin spout. As the water reached a boil, the spout began to emit steam, and she was then ready to take it to the envelope. Calmly, she brought the steam into contact with the envelope flap and began the slow process of melting the glue that held the flap down. Once a part of the flap was separated from the rest of the envelope, she moved the spout in and out of the void, but not for too long, so as to avoid damaging the contents or the envelope itself. After 30 agonizing minutes, the envelope was open, and the men breathed a collective sigh of relief. As one of the agents photographed every word of the message, MI6's finest brought out glue to seal the envelope shut. She then resealed the envelope to look like it had never been disturbed and used an iron to flatten out some wrinkles. I love this method. I love reading about this method and writing about this method. And um, I, I thought it was super cool uh, <laughs> part to include in the book. Matthew, jumping ahead just a little bit. What yeah. kind of intelligence was uh, Lieutenant Commander Huffington's men able to develop in support of uh, allied invasions of uh, both Sicily and Italy? So that was one of the things I mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, how, uh, the, you know, the, you know, the book's title, Operation Underworld, how the mafia and U.S. government teamed up to win World War II. Well, you don't win a war by just securing your home front. You have to take the fight to the enemy. Um, and that's a very unique thing about um, uh, this book and the um, uh, efforts of the intelligence community in New York City during this time. Um, so in early 1943, it's decided that the first target for the invasion of Fortress Europe would be Italy. Uh, specifically Sicily, the island of Sicily. Now, we proceeded to plan, the U.S. did, um, and then the war planners found that they had a very big strategic flaw. They didn't have any, any, basically any information about Sicily itself. They didn't know anything about the beaches, the terrain, the populace, um, their relationship with the German garrisons there. They didn't know anything about the German garrisons, um, you know, or the tides, all information that would be extremely important to um, Allied success. And so a few months in, uh, uh, it's 1943, um, it was uh, an effort started to turn the informants that were gathered during Operation Underworld, who were a lot of Italian Americans or um, uh, native Italians, uh, and use them to gather intelligence about Sicily and Italy itself. So while they had made contacts with various longshoremen, um, uh, you know, all of a sudden they started getting a real interest in asking around for anybody who had been to Sicily or Italy recently. Um, and there's a few instances where they were able to, uh, they were able to find a, a mayor of a, a former mayor of a town in Sicily. Um, they were able to find a couple of masons, uh, who had worked on ships in Sicily, um, in the past year. Um, and, uh, interestingly enough, you know, they're, they're also, uh, you know, started, uh, well, I should back up. The, New York City has had a, a had a big advantage. The U.S. had a big advantage over any other nation who was planning an attack on Italy because there were more Italians in the U.S. in New York City than anywhere else in the world, with the exception, of course, of Italy. Um, and so, through these informants that they had already connect, connected with, um, they, they spread out from there. Please, you know, ask anybody who not only has been to Italy. 
But does anyone have any photographs of Italy, the, the, Italian, the Italian coasts? Are there any postcards? Are there any books? Are there any letters? So all of a sudden, all of this material comes pouring into um, uh, happened in this intelligence network. And what they did was they put together um, large maps um, that were coded with certain reports. So uh, uh, you might find a map, you know, that has a bunch of different um, labels on it and, you know, corresponds to a report. One, one of the uh, labels might correspond to a report about a German garrison in the area. Uh, what one might be about terrain in the area, um, expected resistance. Um, and this became very vital, um, and especially a sense that uh, in a kind of more um, tangible capacity, uh, U.S. war planners plucked um, uh, four officers out of Operation Underworld under Hafenden's command. Um, and they were on the first boats um, uh, that went ashore, uh, Gela and Lakata, uh, the two beaches that the Allies landed at Sicily. Um, and their job, of course, was, you know, the thought was that the Italian populace there wasn't um, uh, very happy with the Germans uh, that were there. So they realized that they needed Italian-Americans who um, uh, may also uh, uh, generate informants um, to talk to the local populace, get them to get on the side of the Americans, uh, and then, of course, help them out in uh, uh, rooting out the German garrisons there. So there's there's instances where um, uh, some of those uh, informants and connections uh, that were established by Luciano um, and the Italian mafia, uh, through these four men, they were actually able to uh, speak with people in Italy who were sympathetic um, because they were pointed the right way from uh, Luciano and, and company. Matthew, is there any evidence that Italian longshoremen in and around New York City constituted any kind of a counterintelligence threat to um, uh, the U.S. and to New York? Well, um, when the war first started, President Roosevelt had actually gone in the air and said that um, that Italian immigrants were an enemy of the people, an enemy of the state. Um, not such a good idea when the majority of the longshoremen, you know, uh, in, in the port of New York are Italian. Um, and it turns out that Roosevelt's statements were completely misguided. Now, of course, the fear was, you know, Italian, Italy being one of the big, you know, three um, countries in the Axis uh, alliance um, and, and the United States harboring so many Italians was that these people were more sympathetic to their country of origin uh, than their country of home, which was the United States. Um, Benito Mussolini, uh, the fascist leader of Italy, had been in power for a couple of decades at that point. Um, and he had rubbed uh, a lot of people the wrong way and were the reason why a lot of these people left in the first place. Um, and especially uh, uh, mafia, um, in mafiosi uh, individuals. Um, uh, he definitely uh, made a big play against organized crime. So um, but in short, uh, you know, the statement from Roosevelt and the feeling, you know, by the Navy uh, who needed to prove or excuse me, answer the question um, if the Italian longshoremen were loyal, you know, patriots. Um, and the answer is that uh, they, they were absolutely loyal patriots. They were there. No evidence that any Italian longshoremen ever did anything to threaten U.S. operations. And uh, there there may have been instances where people of other ethnicities um, uh, perhaps had committed um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, or had been found to, you know, um, uh, uh, bring in precarious situation because there is an instance where a couple of Germans um, uh, were was a couple of suspected German spies were rooted out by an Irish uh, gangster named John Dunn. Um, and uh, it's it's rumored that he murdered both of these individuals. Um, now, uh, I didn't include this because um, uh, the story was recounted by a gangster. <laughs> it was not corroborated by anyone and there's no evidence of it. Um, so what there is evidence of is uh, John Dunn, um, Johnny Cockeye Dunn. <laughs> um, he was kind of the eyes and ear. He, he was another union boss, like I said, Irish gangster. He was responsible for being the enforcement on the popular saying, uh, loose lips sink ships. So he would spend time in the bars around the harbor um, listening on people's conversations, you know, and if you heard them talking too loudly about a ship movement or some kind of classified information, you guarantee that those guys probably met his, or <laughs> he probably beat them up pretty bad. 
Um, and, and those instances are talked about in the book. So the senior mafioso who cooperated with uh, Lieutenant Commander Huffington did so in the hope of somehow improving their uh, personal situation. How did they benefit? One of the reasons why the mafia would even have an interest in the waterfront in the first place is, of course, um, you know, transportation of contraband, but uh, also um, uh, drugs, you know, specifically heroin. Now, with the advent of World War II uh, and then Mussolini's stance and then in Italy and then a loss of uh, so many shipping lanes uh, because of, you know, countries' conflicts with each other, the mafia's drug network uh, to the United States was completely smashed. Um, you know, and to help the U.S. Uh, reestablish these shipping lanes was in their interest, uh, very much so. Um, so that was something that benefited them as well, mutually beneficial. And another another way that the mafia benefited from this is that, you know, I had mentioned uh, earlier that, um, you know, the, the longshoremen, uh, um, you know, on, in the harbor, uh, were very much under ruled under an iron fist, you know, from their um, uh, mafia union leaders. And um, their, you know, one of their one of their tasks, and naval intelligence helped them with this, was to make sure that there were no union strikes um, during uh, during the war. Um, there had been a strike uh, uh, prior to U.S. involvement um, uh, on the harbor, and it you know resulted in a huge backlog of um, uh, supplies being uh, given to England. So there could be no disruption in the supplies; uh, otherwise, lives lives would be lost. So. Um, while it makes a lot of sense, you know, keep everything cool, make sure that the, um, make sure that the supplies lines, um, continue to flow. Uh, you know, it's clear that um, the unions were just the, the laborers themselves were, were put even in a worse situation than they had been before. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of investigative reporting that comes out in the late forties uh, and early fifties. You can see the rampant state. Of mafia involvement there. They're just, you know, involved at every level. Um, you know, murders become more frequent, you know, especially when people start speaking out. So basically it solidified their position uh, on the water. Operation Underworld helped solidify their position on the waterfront. Um, and then, um, you know, a very similar thing happened uh, in Italy. Um, you know, because we had this connection with the mafia and uh, the mafia was no friend to the fascist government, uh, in Italy, um, you know, it behooved us to um, use these men to help us out. Um, and, you know, there's a specific instance where, you know, one of the, the four officers I mentioned earlier uh, goes on a mission with some mafiosi contacts that he makes and um, uh, uh, they have some stunning results. Um, but, you know, overall, higher level, um, as we captured Sicily and then moved northward through the Italian boot, all these voids opened up in local government um, where the Germans had been around, their garrisons had been kind of ruling these areas. They left uh, or their um, the towns had been ruled by uh, Italians who were sympathetic, you know, to the German cause. They were rooted out. And all of a sudden these leadership positions were left open um, and uh, the mafia was, you know, all too willing to just jump right in there uh, and take control. Um, and, you know, they're, they're obviously not, um, you know, they're the type of people who are not going to relinquish um, this control or power uh, easily. Um, so what you're left with, you know, was was very much an empowered mafia, uh, especially when the U.S. and allies left um, Italy after the war. And so we find both of these instances in New York and Italy uh, benefiting the mafia quite a bit. Matthew, I have to ask. Did the lucky Luciano get any portion of his um, imprisonment uh, commuted? Right. So um, I think it was in 1947, there had been a rumor that uh, Luciano was up for the Medal of Honor, um, which was which was kind of a ridiculous uh, notion. But uh, at the same time, uh, it, it's been proven that Meyer Lansky uh, was given the Medal of Freedom, um, Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, and so they certainly helped out uh, the war effort. And um, Luciano, who I mentioned at the beginning, you know, was facing another 25, you know, to 45 years in prison, um, you know, was all too happy to help with the notion that he was he was not given any deal at all. They were very clear there will be no deal. You're helping us out because the United States is at war. And if you love this country, you're going to help. Um, but of course, they were wise to the fact that if he did help, of course, it would help grease the wheels and getting him out of there. Um, 
And so he goes through several appeals processes and tries to, you know, reignite these efforts um, to get himself out. Um, and it's very interesting because it, it comes down to a relationship with one man um, that ends up um, uh, helping him out. And uh, his name is Thomas Dewey. Uh, maybe some of you folks remember the famous uh, newspaper, Dewey Defeats Truman, uh, when actually Thomas Dewey lost the um, uh, 1948 election uh, to, to uh, Thomas Dewey, or excuse me, to um, uh, Truman. Um, and Dewey... Um, he had been, the, he was the governor of New York at the time, and he was the one who actually prosecuted Luciano and threw him in jail. Um, and now all of a sudden at the war's end, he's in the governor's office and Luciano's only chance of getting out is clemency uh, from, from uh, Dewey himself. So um, that clemency is granted, uh, but unfortunately it doesn't quite work out for Luciano like he hoped. Uh, he had a deportation order attached to um, any any parole order that would have been given. So uh, he was very much fighting that at the end of the day, too. He wanted to get out of prison, but he also wanted to remain in New York. And he was caught in this dilemma where getting out of prison meant he could never go back to New York. Uh, but something that he spent the rest of his life trying to do. <laughs> so. Well, it's a fascinating story. Very well told this time. I want to thank Matthew Black for uh, a really entertaining presentation. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and your audience. Um, hope you enjoy. 